Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Innal aqibata lil muttaqin wa la udwana illa ahla az-zalimin. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna sayyidina wa azimana wa habibana Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam abduhu wa rasuluh. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الاولين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الاخرين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الملا الاعلى الى يوم الدين we thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us another opportunity for us to be able to um, you know continue our halqa section after we've went through eid al adha Uh, I, I, I hope that inshallah we are all staying safe and following the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam after Eid al-Adha. Uh, inshallah in a, in a, in a bit to continue the different uh, series and different khalaqa sections that we had one of the ones that we would usually do would be the introduction to the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And under that series inshallah we'll be taking a look at the miraculous nature of the Quran today inshallah and we'll take a look at what that means and how the, how has the Quran you know distinguished itself from every other uh every other book in this world inshallah and without wasting time some of the topics that we will take a look at today inshallah would revolve around um number one, we'll look at the miraculous nature of the Quran and we'll look at the condition of uh mujiza all right what's the what, what are the conditions for mujiza and would we'll compare and contrast between mujiza and karama what's the meaning of mujiza what is karama and what's the difference there and we'll take a brief look at sihir which is magic and what's the difference between mujiza and sihir and karama and sihir inshallah they would we'll also take a look at the proof of uh ijaz all right the proof of ijaz would be the miraculous the miraculous nature of the quran and what's the proof for that and do we find can we find that same proof in the quran and if there's a proof for that can anything replicate it so if nothing can replicate it there should be a challenge in place so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses multiple challenges in the Quran to try to challenge mankind and jinn kind to try to bring some type of ijaz that looks similar to the Quran and we'll talk a little bit about that inshallah and we'll also talk about the different types of ijaz that we have that's captured in the Quran and the style of uh, revelation of the Quran inshallah so without wasting time we'll take we'll, we'll jump into the first um uh topic of today which would be the miraculous nature of the Quran so when we talk about the miraculous nature of the Quran essentially what we're referring to is ijaz al quran al karim right the miraculous the, the miraculous nature of the Quran itself and that word ijaz it comes from a foundational word called the ajaz right and that ajaz means for something to be incapable or for something to be weak for something to be incapable or for something to be weak so therefore we say that the miracles that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the miracles that they perform are called mu'jiza all right they are called mu'jiza because mankind are incapable of performing the same miracles they're incapable of performing those same acts so because the prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the only ones that are capable of performing miracles we say we say that we pro, we, we 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 use the word for it we, we use the word called mujiza to refer to it and in the quran and in the hadith there is no word there's no relation of that word the quran would usually call uh things like that an aya or bayina all right a, a bayan or an aya but in words that have been coined out by the scholars they would use the word mujiza to refer to the miracles 
that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done and no one else has the same type of power or skill to be able to replicate it, all right? So moving forward, we would say for us to better understand what mujiza is, we would say that mujiza is divine, de defined as an act that's performed by a prophet or by, by prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of a miraculous nature. We say it's of a miraculous nature because it's different from what we know to be a consistent act of nature, right? So it's something extraordinary, is something super ordinary, right? So it's an act of a, it's an it's a it's an act that's performed by the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of a miraculous nature that humans are incapable of imitating and they're also incapable of replicating. So they cannot go back and do those acts. All right? People cannot go back and do those acts. Those acts are strictly, you know, permitted or approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his messengers to be able to do them. So we say that mujizah, uh, mujizah is, is, an, is an actual act. It's an actual act while ijaz is the concept of that act. The concept is known as ijaz while the actual act itself is called mujizah. And the Quranic terminology for it would be an ayah, a sign, an ayah. So we understand the conditions. We understand that mujas, mujasa should be should be carried out by or can be carried out by only the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for us to better explain this, the scholars have put in uh, a multiple or a few amounts of uh, conditions for an action or an extraordinary action to be considered a mujiza. For an ex before an extraordinary action will be considered a mujiza, the, it has to meet all of these criteria. So I've tried as much as possible to identify uh, a few of those criteria that if we can, if we see all of these criteria in place, then it that special act that unique act that supernatural act will be considered a mujiza right so a mujiza has to meet all of these criteria number one it has to occur with the command or with the approval of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all right it has to be with the approval of allah and none else with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and none else. I'll give you an example. In the Quran, when Prophet Isa alayhi salam uh, talked to the, um, his people and he told them that, Inni min that I can create for you from clay a similitude of bird. And then I would blow onto it it then becomes a bird by the approval, by the commandments, by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a mujiza is something that's out of the ordinary. You and I cannot grab a clay and mold it, put some water and mold it and just blow on it mold it and shape it in the form of a bird and just breathe on it and expect and expect for it to become a bird and then fly right things like that would be done by the prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it needs the approval of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it to happen that's why prophet isa alayhi salam tells his people that he he did it or he would do it be iznillah be easily life by the permission of Allah. He goes on to tell them that he can give life to the death by the power of Allah. He can tell them what they ate and what they've stored in their houses by the permission of Allah. So when we see things like this being done with the permission of Allah, with the command and approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it comes under a mujizah. All right? It does come under a mujizah. Another condition is that 
it must be out of the ordinary occurrence of nature. The ordinary occurrence of nature would not be for you to grab a clay and, and mold it like a bird and breathe onto it, and then it becomes a bird. That's not an ordinary occurrence of nature. That's something totally different. That's something supernatural. That's something that the normal mind would consider impossible. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's nothing that's impossible. So the, he would use it, he would use, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would use his prophets to be able to demonstrate that he is a God and he is a God that can determine for a thing to be. And whenever he decides a thing, he only says to it, be, and it is. Another condition would be that it cannot be performed again by any person or any object. Because it's a mujiza, Allah permits for it to happen, right? So if it's, if it's happened the first time, that sign is sufficient for the people that the prophet or that prophet was sent to, all right? So no one else will be able to come back and do the same thing. No one else will be able to come back and perform that same act. Because again, it would not be within the, uh, the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, within the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One very important one is that it must occur at the hands of a prophet. It must occur at the hands of a prophet. So anybody that would conduct or demonstrate something or perform something that we would consider to be a mojiza, a mojiza that person would be a prophet. So can somebody today tell you that they conducted or they performed a mujiza? No, because there's no more prophethood on earth. The last prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to mankind, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had completed all of the works of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's no more prophethood after him. So there is the, what, does, what that means is that there is no more mujiza that would happen on earth. Because a mujiza must occur, occur or happen at the hands of a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Another condition for mujiza would be that the act must match the claim of the prophets. If that prophet claims that Allah had given them certain signs, and they're going to use that sign to demonstrate the glory of Allah or the oneness of Allah and to call people to uh, the oneness of Allah, that sign that they demonstrate must match what they claim. Also, the act must not refute the prophet's claim. So if they do, if they conduct or perform any mujiza, any supernatural act, that supernatural act cannot come back and then say, oh, this person is not the prophet of Allah. For example, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, Allah had blessed him with the opportunity to be able to do, uh, give life to the deaf, right? By the permission of Allah. Now, if he gives life to a dead person and that person wakes up and then said, oh, this man, Isa alayhi salam, he is not a prophet of Allah. So the sign, the mujiza that he has, cannot refute his prophethood. If it does, now he's not a prophet. I hope that's clear, inshallah. Now, and in that case, he would not be a prophet. So we've talked about the conditions of mujiza. But there's something else that's similar to mujiza that we can potentially, potentially still experience on earth. And that's called karama. It's called karama, right? So for us to better understand what karama is, I'm going to, I, I have a table here where I identify just three things or three differences that both of them would have. What would be the difference between a mujiza and a karama, inshallah. So like we've previously stated, the mujiza, the mujiza, which is the sign, which is the supernatural act that's beyond normal natural occurrence, right? It has to occur at the hands of a prophet of Allah. A prophet of Allah would have to be the one demonstrating that mujiza. For example, 
Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Prophet Musa alayhi salam. During his time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had asked him to go confront uh, the Pharaoh, Fir'aun, and then to call him to Islam, to call him to Tawheed. And then he gave him some, uh, a few signs. One of the signs was, to, was for him to be able to turn his staff into a snake, right? So we see that happening, and that happens by Ibnillah, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And he was a prophet. In the case of a karama, a karama would happen, a karama would happen or would occur at the hands of a pious person. A pious person, not just anybody in the streets, not somebody that's, that's totally going against the teachings and the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person has to be a pious person and that person has to follow the teachings of the prophets of their time. For our own current time, the person has to follow the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a pious person of our time would be potentially, by the permission of Allah, would be able to carry out or perform some type of karama. And in that case, they're not calling towards themselves. They're calling towards the teachings of the prophets that they follow, the prophet of their time, which is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another criteria, would, another difference would be that miraculous nature, the miraculous nature under, that, that, are, that are under mujiza, they're superior to a karama because they're being carried out by or performed by the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other case, a karama is also a miraculous nature. It's also an action of a miraculous nature. However, it's inferior when you compare it to a mujiza. A karama is inferior when you compare it to a mujiza. And then we also say that the supernatural acts, meaning the mujiza, all right, the supernatural acts, it's meant to aid, it's meant to support, it's meant to equip, it's meant to empower the message that the prophets came with. It's meant to demonstrate that whatever they called onto is the truth and they're not lying, right? While karama, on the other hand, karama of a pious person it's also included under the mujiza of their prophets. So in, within our time today, if anyone, if Allah blesses anyone to be able to do a karama, that karama would come under the mujiza of the prophets of their time. For example, we have some sect or some brothers in our religion that claim that Certain sheikhs, certain khul ulama have conducted some type of karama. All right? For example, Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz, for example, and Sheikh Adam, for example, you know, and other scholars like that, that they've done certain things. Alhamdulillah, Allah knows the unseen. However, whatever they've done comes under the mujiza of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of their actions is still inferior to that of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all of their actions, according to the scholar, he's also included among the mujiza of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I hope I've been able to distinguish between a mujiza and a karama. By, by you know, I want to reemphasize that a mujiza can be carried out by a prophet with commandment from Allah and approval from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be an act that's not normal nature. It has to be something that's unique. And the prophets would usually request the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before they can do it. While when it comes to karama, a, a, a believer, a pious person that follows the teachings of their prophets would be able to conduct or carry out a karama.
right? And we say that karama are you are always inferior to the mujiza of the prophets. The karama are inferior to the mujiza of the prophets. And then the karama also comes under, it's included among the mujiza of the prophet of their time. The mujiza of the prophet of their time. So there's one more that stands out, and we really have to pay attention to this. If you've not learned, if you not learn anything today, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this information. And it's called sihir. Sihir is magic or the act of tricking people, the act of deception, the act of innovation. All right. The act of innovation might look similar, might look similar to karama. But well, that's a huge difference. If you remember when we talked about karama, we said that a karama must be carried out by a pious person, by a pious person. And they don't call towards themselves. They stick to the teachings of their prophets, the prophet of their time. All right? Um, if the person that's to carry out the karama lived in the time of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he would follow the footsteps and the teachings of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He would not invent anything and he would not call towards himself. In this current era, we live in the era of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because no other prophet would come after him. So anyone that would con uh, carry out or perform a karama would follow the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and would not call towards themselves they would call towards the same teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam called towards the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Seer on this in this in this case is totally different because seer is carried out by magicians, so they're not pious people. You can tell that they're not pious people. People, they're not observing salah. They're not fasting. They're not paying zakah. They're not enjoying good and forbidding evil. Right? They're not taking care of the orphans. They're not encouraging positive relationship within the society. They are the corruptors. They are the ones calling to themselves. They are the ones hurting the needy. They are the ones being cruel to the weak. These are the magicians. These are the innovators. These are the people that seeks, that seeks the help of the jinn to be able to do whatever trick or magic that they do. And as believers, we should never be fooled by that. We should never be fooled by that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the, the encounter of Prophet Musa alayhi salam with the magicians in the time of Prophet, uh, in the time of um, uh, Fir'aun when he went to deliver Allah's message to Fir'aun. And when they had that conversation, they called upon all of the troops, all of the, all of the magician. And when the magician came, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah to Yunus, Surah 10, verse 81, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Falamma alqu qala Musa majitum bihi sir. In Allah sayubutilu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says And when the magicians had thrown down their staffs all right, And their staffs became like snakes Qala Musa, Prophet Musa alayhi salam then said Majitum bihi sir What you have brought today, it's only magic what you've came with is only magic. It's magic because, number one, they're not prophets, so it cannot be mujiza. Number two, they're not pious people, so it cannot be karama. So for them to do something that's a little bit super out of the ordinary nature, it means that it's sir. So Prophet Musa identifies it as sir. He says, maji tumbihi sir. What you came with today, what you've brought today, is only magic. In Allah sayubutilu. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy it 
Allah would expose all of his worthlessness. It does not mean anything. Muslims should not be scared of tricks or magic. Inna Allah sayubitulu, sayubitulu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would destroy it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would render it useless. Inna Allah la yuslihu amal al-mufsideen. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not amend the work of the corruptors. Allah does not amend the work of the corruptors, the, the works of the evildoers. So those that are the evildoers are those that would work with the jinn. And these jinns, they are creations of Allah that were created before we were created. They were created 2,000 years before we were created. And they don't take, they can take any form. They're not like humans. They can take any forms and they can, they can run or go a, a farther distance within a short second. All right. They, 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 their, their type of transformation is not our type of transformation. So when a person uses genes to do magic, they do things that we would consider to be a mujiza, but it's not a mujiza because one, they're not a prophet. They do things that we might consider to be a karama, but it's not a karama because they are not pious people. So we can tell that it's magic. A person can grab a coin and pass it through a wall and then it comes up from another coin. A solid going through another solid. We see that to be abnormal or something that we might consider to be supernatural. But because this person is not a prophet and they're not a pious person following the teachings of that prophet, we know that it's a clear magic. It's clear magic. So for us to better understand this portion, I'm spending a little bit more time because when Dajjal surfaces, when he emerged, he would do a lot of miracles. He would do a lot of magic. And unfortunately, people would follow him because they don't understand the concept of magic. They cannot differentiate between mujiza and karama and magic. Dajjal was, was, is not a prophet, so it cannot be a mujiza. Dajjal, it's not, he's not a pious man, so it would not be, and it cannot be a karama. It's only magic. He would employ he would employ the use of genes to resurrect people from the dead, to, you know, make vegetations come up. And, you know, he would do a lot of things, but not with his power and not with the authority of Allah. However, with working with the genie, because genie, they can do things in a practical form that we can see. They can even move a solid a solid material, they can move him from one point to another point. They can carry things that are really, really heavy. So you see a person would use one finger to carry a huge box or something that's maybe like 70 or 100 pounds. And you're wondering, how are they able to do it? They're not the ones doing it. It's the genie that's working with them that's doing it. So it's all magic. And Allah tells us, in the law has a yobotilo. Allah would destroy every form of magic. He would expose every form of magic. And he would render it weak, every form of magic. So as believers, we don't go with magic. We stick to the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, in Surah al -Ta Allah also tells us the tricks of magicians. So no believers, again, should be fooled by their tricks because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al Taha, Allah tells him, throw, tells Prophet Musa alayhi salam, alayhi salam, throw down what is in your right hand, it would swallow, it would swallow up all that they have crafted, it will swallow up all that the magicians have crafted. What they have crafted is only the tricks of a magician. It's only the tricks of a magician. 
and the magicians would never be successful no matter what amount of skill that they've learned or attained. It does not matter what they do, they will never be so successful. So as believers, we do not pitch our tents with the magicians. Rather, we follow the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to hack in onto. Inshallah, going into the second portion, the second part of today's uh, uh, lecture, inshallah, we also want to take a look at the proof of ijazah. The proof of ijazah, right? Oh, sorry, sorry, the proof of ijaz. Not ijaz, astaghfirullah, the proof of ijaz. How, what is the meaning of ijaz for us to better understand it? Ijaz, is, it's a sign. It's the miracle of the Quran. It's the, it's the concept of the miracles that the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came with. And we've already explained that ijaz comes from the word ajiz, which is something that's impossible to do, or something that we're incapable of doing, or we're too weak to do. So for it to not become a mojiza, the prophet will be able to do things that normal humans cannot do. The prophet will be able to do things that normal humans cannot do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equipped all of his prophets to be able to do certain things that would serve as miracles and signs, for the people of their time, for the people that they were sent to, all right? So it's part of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that whenever he sends a prophet, he would usually give that prophet certain miracles and signs so that they can prove their prophethood to their people, so that they can demonstrate that they are, they are a prophet. Because many times, the people will tell the prophet, so... Before we can believe in you, you have to do X, Y, Z kind of sign. For example, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, the Jews told him that before they can believe in him, that he should talk to his God and his God should send down a table spread with food, like a buffet. All right? So they can eat from it. So Prophet Isa told them, are you, are you not scared of Allah or do you think that this is all jokes? Then Prophet Isa then invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He asked Allah, Anzil alayna ma'idata min as So please, O oh Allah, send down for us a table spread with food so that it can be a sign for the first of us and the last of us and an ayah from, from you and a, and a blessing from you, right? And that happened. That happened. So those are signs and miracles that can be done by the prophets of Allah, but with the permission of Allah, it's not a common thing. You and I cannot sit there and make dua, and a, food, a, a, a table of food would just come down and we can eat from it. No, it does not work that way. It does not work that way. Or as another example is when Prophet Musa alayhi salam, all right, when his people were starving and they were thirsty, he used his staff to strike the rock. And the rock then had 11. Sorry, the rock then had um, parts of the, the rock that started coming out, 11 parts of it, where water was gushing out. And each tribe, the Quran says, called the Each of the tribe then knew which of the, which of the path of water they would drink from. That's part of a mujizah from that Allah demonstrated through the hands of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And there's some, a lot of them like that. A lot of them like that. So Allah goes to remind us in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, verse Surah 2, uh, Surah 2 verse 211, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sal bani Israel kam ateynahum min ayatin bayyina. Ask the children of Israel, the children of Israel, meaning the Jews, how many signs, how many signs of evidence have we given them? Allah gave them a lot of signs. So all of these ayatun bayina, they are the ijaz that we're talking about in the Quran. 
all right? The Quran calls it ayah, and the scholars would use the word ijaz because we humans, we are weak. We were incapable of performing things like this, all right? So, Sal Bani Israel asked the people of uh, Israel, the Jews, Kam min ayatin bayina? How many signs, how many signs of evidence that their prophet that came to them was a prophet and that they should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of those signs have we given them? All right? Again, it's a lot of signs. It's a lot of signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. Many of them, a few of them believed and many of them did not believe. But those signs came from their prophets and they had the option to either believe those signs or not believe those signs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes to tell us a little bit more about the miraculous nature of the Quran and how the Quran itself captures a lot of ijaz in it. A lot of ijaz in it. In Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah 29, from verse 50 to verse 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the greatest miracle that he has sent down and this greatest miracle is the quran that we all read today right when prophet muhammad sallallahu was sent to his people he called them to the words of allah he called them to the teachings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of allah to worship only one god and to abandon all of these idols that they worshiped at the time right to abandon all of the idols that they worshipped at the time. So Allah tells us in Surah Al-Ankabut, And they said, why, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? So the Quraysh were saying that, why is it that signs are not sent down to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Then Allah tells him, Tell them, O Prophet Muhammad these signs are only with Allah. All of the signs, all of the ijaz are only with Allah. And I, I, Prophet Muhammad, I am only a clear warner. My job is to come warn you. My job is not to show you miracles every day. If Allah permits, I give you a miracle. But I don't just do miracles by my own will. It has, it has to come under the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet goes to say, Awalam yakfihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes to say, Awalam yakfihim anna anzalna alayka al-kitaba yutla alayhim. Is it not sufficient for them as a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down revelation? That he sends down revelation to you, which is the book. Which is the book which used, which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi would then yutla alayhim, then recite to the people. So Jibril comes down with the revelation, the Prophet reads it, and then recites, to, to, recites it to them. Many times those verses that comes down would be in form of a response to a question or to challenge their ideas or to, you know, set the stage straight for them to understand it. For them to understand it essentially. Then Allah says, In that, in that, meaning in the coming down or in the revelation of the book of Allah, Al-Quran, la rahma, there's mercy in it. And it's a reminder for a people who truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah tells us here that the Quran is the number one mujiza, is the number one mujiza, the number one ayah over any other ayah that a person can have. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down the Quran as a, as a miracle and he expects that inshallah his ummah would be the most largest ummah on the day of judgment because they would follow the quran so the 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 the, the, the effects 
of the Quran will carry the largest miracle or the largest, um, the Quran will carry the largest miracle on the day of judgment in a case where you see more Muslims or more believers lining up or following Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So because we say that the signs in the Quran, all right, the ijaz in the Quran are unique and it cannot be done by anybody else. Allah uses the Quran itself as an ijaz, an ijaz, because that Quran, the Quran that we read every day, it's so powerful. And it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing can be compared to the wisdom of Allah. So the word of Allah compared to the word of mankind is as though you're comparing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a man. There's no comparison there. Allah created the man. Allah is superior to the man. So the word of Allah, Al-Quran, is superior to any book that anybody would write. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges all of mankind here. He, Allah gives us a few verses, about five verses or six verses, to challenge the entire mankind and the jinn kind. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us when he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim over here Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wa in kuntum fi raybin mimma nazzalna ala 'abdina fatu bi suratin min mithlihi wa da'u shuhada'akum min dunillah in kuntum sadiqin So Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says Wa in kuntum fi raybin mimma nazzalna ala 'abdina if you are in doubt Regarding what we've sent down upon our, 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 our slave or our worshipper, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah challenges all of us. Fatu bi mithli. Come with one surah. Bring a surah that looks like the surahs in the Quran. And look for your assistants, those that are going to help you in this process, aside from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in kuntum sadiqin if you are truly speaking the truth if you are truly speaking the truth then allah follows it by saying allah follows it by saying uh fa in lam tafalu wa lan tafalu fa taku nar allati waquduha an-nas wal hijara widdat lil kafirin if you are not able to do it and you will not be able to do it so allah knew that we're not going to be able to do it because it's a mujiza. And no other mujiza is greater than the mujiza of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا If you're not able to do it, وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا And you will not be able to do it, فَتَكُنْ نَارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُوا النَّاسُ وَالْهِجَارَةُ So then, fear the fire, the blazing fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which it's few it's few that makes it born it's mankind the unbelievers that will be thrown in there and rocks and stones and it's been prepared for those that denied and disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the kafiruns in another verse in the Quran Allah says Am yakulun aftara? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am yakulun aftara? Here. All right. Are they saying that he lied? Kul fatu bi suratin mithli. Tell them to bring a surah that's just like one of the surah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa du'u man istatatum min dunillah. And call upon whoever you want to call upon. Could be another human. It could be a jinni, it could be all of mankind aside from Allah in Kuntum Sadiqin, if you're truly speaking the truth. So Allah is giving us a lot of tahdid here, all right, a lot of challenge here. But again, we would not be able to meet the, this challenge, we would not be able to meet it. Allah also goes further to tell us, Kul lainishtamatul insu wal jinn. If tell them that even though all of the mankind and all of the jinn kind come together to collaborate, Allah and Yatu be Quran, 
so that they can bring a similar Quran that looks like this type of Quran, that can compare with this Quran, that can match this Quran. Look, Allah says, La yatuna bimithli. They will not be able to come with a Quran that matches this Quran. Even though they're constantly helping themselves and constantly aiding themselves in the entire process, they will never be able to come, come up with a, a similar Quran. So that's a strong challenge. And to date, no one can write a book that can be as timeless like the Quran, that can be as meaningful like the Quran, that can be as impactful like the Quran, that can be as life-changing like the Quran. When Allah speaks, He speaks the truth, and there's nothing that can compare to the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, we're coming towards the end of today's section, inshallah. The third uh, topic we wanted to talk, talk on or touch on would be the types of ijaz, the types of uh, uh, miracles or signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has identified in the Quran, has shown us in the Quran. And for us to better understand this type of ijaz, we would need to understand what the scholars have talked about and better understand how the Quran has been designed, how the Quran has been collated and you know, put together based on the recommendation of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one of our predecessors, one of our scholars by the name Muhammad Bunu, Bunu Juzay Al-Kalbi, he said, or he had divided the, the Ijaz of the Quran into 10 different categories. He had divided the Ijaz of the Quran into 10 different categories. And for us to better understand all of these 10 categories, we have to, be, we have to read the Quran extensively to be, able, to be able to see the light in this sign and in this miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in the Quran. So the first he explained is the eloquence of the Quran above that of any human speech. The Quran is an eloquent book. Allah had put the Quran in, in a way where it's so eloquent and nothing can be matched with it. Nothing can be compared to it. All right? It's inimitable. You cannot imitate the Quran. All right? You cannot bring something that's similar to it because of the eloquence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in it. The eloquence is so high to the extent where the, the Arabs at the time, they were also eloquent in Arabic, but when they heard the Quran, they felt as though Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam had been overtaken by magic or he became a poet that superseded all of them in knowledge. But rather, he was not a poet. He was not a magician. He was only inspired by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala through Prophet uh, Jibreel Alayhi Salam and he was then able to be able to recite this eloquent words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another category that's identified for Ijaz is the unique arrangement and organization of the surahs in the Quran and the verses in the Quran. The way the surahs have lined up and the way the verses were arranged, they show and they demonstrate that the, the, the wisdom behind them is far greater than that of a human being is far greater than that of a human being. Another, another uh, category we want to take a look at would be um, the incapability to produce anything similar to it. So the Quran is so unique that no, no one can produce anything similar to it. The previous verse slides, I showed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged all of mankind and the jinn kind to produce a similar Quran or bring about a verse or bring about a surah in the Quran that, uh, of their own that, that can match or can be compared with the Quran. And no, no one can do that. So that makes the Quran a, a, a sign, a miraculous book by its own self. Also, the stories and the accounts of the prophets and the nations of old 
So the Quran tells us, it gives us detailed stories and the account of prophet that came. And if you look at it, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never knew the stories. He never met all of those prophets in person, except when he did Isra wal Miraj. But he never met them and had a conversation with them. He never read the books of the Jews. He never read the books of the Christians. So how was he able to bring such detailed accounts for us to learn from? An example would be the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. When he spoke, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that he's going to tell us about Ahsan al-Hadith, the best type of story. And it starts with Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam saying to his father, Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba wa shamsa wal qamar ra'aytuhum li sajidin. That I've seen 11. That I've seen 11 um, uh, stars and the sun and the moon bowing down for me. And he goes on to tell the entire story of how his brothers betrayed him, how he got sold into slave trade, how the wife of the Aziz attempted to seduce him, how he then got into jail, how he spent double the time in jail. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be compared to anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be matched with anything. Nothing looks like him. Nothing can be compared to him. He is one God. He is the eternally besought of God. Lam yelid wa lam yulad. Allah had not given birth and he was not given birth to. Wa lam yekun lehu kufwan ahad. And there's nothing that looks like him. Nothing could be compared to him. Nothing could be matched with him. And no one, no one shares his sovereignty with him. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And in that same case, when he speaks, his words are also superior to any other words on earth. That's why no one can match the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fifth uh, category that the scholars talked about is the prediction, uh, the prediction which occurred in the Quran, which later came through. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some predictions that are captured in the Quran that later came through. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Alif Lam, Alif Lam, uh, in Surah to, in Surah to Rum, the second verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Rome, the Rome, Rome will be conquered. They will be defeated. And after a while, they would regain and also win the battle. Did that not happen? Yes, it did happen. So that's a prediction in the Quran that happened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had that perfect knowledge. So nothing else can be compared to the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> The sixth um, category that was identified is the identification of the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran captures many of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Qudus, Al-Ghafoor, Al-Raqib, Al-Hasib, Al-Shaheed. You know, all of these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it captures attribute of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hand. When Allah says, Yadullah Foko ID him, that his hand is above their hands, right? And Allah had given the Prophet a lot of miracles. And we can talk about that, inshallah, if we have the time. And we talk about how uh, another category would be the laws and the sharia of the Quran. And, and they came through the through Allah uh, through uh, the Quran. The laws and the sharia came through the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had preserved it for us. And then the eighth one would be that the fact that it has been protected and remain unchanged. So the Quran has been protected. Allah vows to protect the Quran and there's no corruption that can enter into the Quran. And Allah had ensured that the Quran would not be changed. And the Quran has been another, another uh, category was that the ease by which the, uh, it is being memorized or preserved. There's no book on earth that you have thousands and hundreds and thousands and millions of people memorizing the book 
from front to back, word for word. And if you wake them at 2 a.m. in the morning, they're ready to go and just start reciting the book. There's no book on earth that looks like that. Only the Quran. Because Allah, this, Allah has determined that the Quran will be preserved through the memory of people. And when you preserve things like that, it's hard for you to get it out of the, um, um, out of the minds of the, the people. The last one we want to talk around, talk about, inshallah, and then wrap up for today, is that the, de the, the deep meaning that is present in the Quran. So the Quran has deep meaning, and whenever you go to read the Quran, you'll be able to identify that you learn new things over and over again. You gain new understanding over and over again. If you finish reading the Quran today, you will, you will see the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wisdom. And when you go back to read the Quran again, it feels as though you've not read it before because you will start seeing, you're learning things and you wonder, but I read the Quran the first time. I, why didn't I notice this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has deep meanings in the Quran and he decides to open our minds and our hearts to be able to understand and connect those meanings whenever he wants. And I ask, uh, I, I hope that inshallah we've been able to cover some important parts today. Uh, we're we're going to round up, we're going to stop here for, for today. I'm going to round up today's section. Um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and bless all our effort in the deen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, uh, forgive us all of our sins. Those that are uh, the Muslims that are currently alive to forgive them their sins and uh, put us back on the right path. And those that have, um, that have passed on, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to also uh, forgive them their sins. Uh, I want to extend a quick uh, dua to my niece, my brother Mahmoud Ahmed Shraib. He lost um, his daughter, a three-year-old, yesterday. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make, uh, make it uh, uh, easy for him to go through this trying time. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a cause of him entering into our agenda. Give him the sabr to be able to withstand this pain and this difficult time. And the family, the entire family too. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the baby that had passed on. I ask Allah to make her among those that will be entered into our agenda. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to then reunite all of us and all our family in the agenda of Firdaus. أقول قول هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين أستغفرهم إنه وغفور رحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته